In yes. your study of crustaceans, are there particular crustaceans that you all have a sense or you hope are more resilient than others at this point? Or how, sure. how much conjecture can you... Know, you know, I, I think the, um, the best comparison you can make for most of the people that are not working in these fields are the term weeds. What happens when you really mess something up? Well, the weeds are going to come back. The roaches will be there, you know. And so, to some extent, these very resilient organisms are the weeds of the system. And uh, weeds are not all bad. I mean, they're, they're often the, the first step to getting back to where you want to be because it takes a few weeds to die and generate some organic material uh, in order for the succession to occur that will restore what you want. So uh, both of us have examples like that where there are the weed species, and uh, those generally tend to be very common. They're widely distributed. They're not very habitat-specific. They can tolerate a lot of environmental insult. Sometimes they have bad side effects to them. They may be super bad predators on other things, or they might be a plant that has a toxin in it that hurts other things, or a sponge, you know. So it's not automatically assumed that just because you've got something growing there, it's the health you want. And the other problem is, is that you generally when you have environmental complexity, when you have a very complex system and you have many species living together, you have a resilience. What if one disease organism comes out that takes out the weed? Then you have nothing. It's kind of the old wheat field compared to the forest um, uh, analogy where in a wheat field, if you get a wheat disease, the wheat's gone. If you have a forest, well, it might take out a few of the plants, but another hundred of them are still there producing away. So mm -hmm. we would like to see the environmental complexity and diversity uh, generally is an indicator of that, where you have many different species of either of these groups living. You have a very healthy uh, environment. Mm. I want to tell people who are just tuning in, my guest is Dr. Daryl Felder. He is a professor of biology here at UL Lafayette, also head of the Laboratory for Crustacean Research here at the university. He and his colleague, Dr. Suzanne Frederick, just received an NSF, National Science Foundation, rapid grant to do some study uh, on the Gulf. You all are hoping to apply for a much larger grant as well uh, to do more in-depth study over the next four or five years in right. addition to this. Right. Now, the first opportunity that you all have to go out is in November. That's right. I mean, one of the bottlenecks in this whole thing is vessel availability. Uh, the grant itself that comes to uh, UL is a little under $200,000, but there's an additional uh, 80000 that uh, goes toward vessel support, and that never really comes to us. It's run through an NSF program called the UNALS program, which is a university research vessel program. And we tend to use our own vessels here at LUMCON, which are part of the, LUM, the uh, UNALS program, the RV Pelican, uh, which was built as part of our consortium. And so that's the vessel that really is perfectly equipped for us. Well, it's not available until November, and that means that everything going on between now and November are other UNALs or NSF-sponsored uh, cruises. Now, that's not necessarily bad because we really want to get to the point that oil has stopped being introduced to the Gulf of Mexico, that we've seen our maximum potential impact. There's no point to go out halfway through it and say, oh, it's this bad, now it's potentially going to be worse. We don't know. So let it get done, and then we'll go out to our very same banks that we sampled before. We'll sample them the same way. <clears throat> we'll see, number one, are there impacts? Maybe this skipped them, you know, maybe this went around, and maybe the diffuse oil in the water column uh, did not impact them. You know, I keep my fingers crossed because none of us want to see um, the worst-case scenario. Uh, but there's, you know, what we're going to look for also is not everything being extinguished versus nothing happening, we're going to look for all kind of intermediate level effects. Uh, so impacts potentially on reproductive states, impacts on how uh, rich the species diversity is, uh, impacts on how many mature animals we find versus immature, do we find diseased organisms. We'll be taking tissue samples while we're doing this to send them off for hydrocarbon analysis compared to pre and post. Right. So. Just what you're saying right here is so much more complex than what we generally read in the news. You know, if I just think about what are the major animals I hear about in the, in the news, it's sea turtles and pelicans. And those photograph very well, I guess. Um, but uh, when Suzanne was here a few weeks ago, I mean, she was very passionate about the algae and really how much more important that is to um, the sustaining of this this. Uh, eco-diversity, this biodiversity that you're talking about, and that doesn't really get talked about, does it? Doesn't. It, it doesn't. Mm -hmm. The obvious do. Mm -hmm. You know, we hate 
to see all birds as much as anyone, and uh, that's one of the obvious effects. When oil is on the surface, you're going to see oiling of marine birds, and it's pathetic. Uh, turtles, you'll see uh, marine mammals wash up. Well, that's, for us... Heartbreaking. That's, mm -hmm. that's heartbreaking, but we know that there's another part of this water column that we've got to be concerned about, and uh, particularly with the amount of oil that's been dispersed uh, into the water column. We're very concerned about where that's gone, uh, what its fate and, and effects are going to be. I if it is diffused and it's actually settling out on reefs between 70 and 90 meters deep, we're going to see a signature of that that's mm -hmm. going to be evident. Mm -hmm. And we suspect it is because these things don't just go away. It's just because it's off the surface, it's out of sight, but it's not out of mind, and uh, it's it's doing something, it's got to go somewhere. Right. Well, give people a sense of, I was reading an article today, I guess, in the Times-Picayune about um, young crabs being found with oil in them. I, I don't think a lot of us really understand what that would do to a creature. What right. What kind of impact does oil have right. on creatures that I, you study i've actually seen the uh, the photographs of those they're they're juvenile blue crabs they're, they're the last stage of the larval history and they do appear to have little oil droplets in them the problem is we have yet to get the analysis back on those oil droplets and there are things like natural lipids in crabs that they use for nutrition normally they're not distributed the way i saw them in these photographs so, so it's a it's a reason to be suspicious um, if if you're actually inculcating very tiny droplets of oil, which would potentially be this dispersed oil that's in the water column, into these larvae, there's two reasons for concern, two big reasons. One is that you're obviously going to impact uh, the metabolism of an animal that's got to mature and go through many molds before it grows up into a big crabby harvest. So the likelihood is if you're seeing visible oil droplets in them, other than just traces in their tissue in a hard hydrocarbon analysis, there's a lots of oil in them. What's that doing there and what's that going to do to them? Nobody really knows. Mm -hmm. Literature's terrible on this and we just don't have it. But the other fear is that a tremendous number of marine organisms live on larvae. They're larval feeders. They are um, juvenile fish eat the heck out of these larvae. They eat copepods, eat all kind of other things of the same size class. So what you've done is if if, again, these droplets turn out to be uh, dispersed all, you've established a pathway by which that gets into the diet of yet other animals. And the big fear has always been, okay, at some point, m much of this oil is probably going to enter a food chain. And what's, what are the pathways? How does this happen? Does it stick to the outside of them? Well, literature does show that indeed it does. It can stick to the outside. But if something's consuming a couple thousand larvae a day and it's got that much oil, in an individual one or two that I've seen pictures of, that's very much a concern because that's going to start having uh, potential impacts. And, and the other thing you've got to be concerned with, and the, the reason you don't want to get sort of too carried away with this, is you want to know more about that oil just than the fact you've seen some visual evidence of it. Is the aromatic fraction there? Is it the toxic fraction? You know, there, there's different fractions, and oil does weather. Um, the oil on the surface rather quickly weathers from sunlight and uh, heat exposure. Um, oil in the water column is going to eventually be attacked by microbes, and that's what most people bank on. You disperse it, and you say, well, natural microbes are going to take, and they will. It's, mm -hmm. it's a time frame is the mm -hmm. issue. And also just, you know, we, we know that microbes will, but uh, how, how much oil can they do and before they're consumed or got killed it. themselves? It's, do you saturate the system? Mm -hmm. What's the carrying capacity? You know, we have natural oil seeps off Louisiana. It's one of the things I study in addition to banks. It's phenomenal. I've gone down and collected animals that are basically living and bubbling up crude oil. They're happy there, but they're adapted to that. And uh, they you can't have just introduce that into no. an environment. <laughs> and that's not the same ones mm -hmm. we're eating. Trust right. me, you wouldn't want to. They're very strange, and they're not very numerous. Um, but it does mean that those are... Even, even those areas are reservoirs for, for microbes. So there are oil-consuming microbes. It's can you oversaturate the system with how much you put into it? Uh, and then secondly, what is the rate? Let's say you don't oversaturate it. You know, this, this is going to correct it. It's going to, you know, once we stop the oil flow, it's going, to, it's going to come around. But how long and what's going to happen during that time period? If, you know, we've already gone through a reproductive season, so we are in a large area of the Gulf of Mexico almost certainly negatively impacting reproductive cycles of, of fishery species and non-fishery species. Um, what if we do that for two years? What's going to happen? Um, it leaves big question marks, too. What does the Gulf States Fishery Commission do about setting limits next year on red snapper, grouper, um, 
cartoon. You know, do you weigh this in? Do we have the data to weigh it in? Or do you just assume things are like they were last year so we can still have the typical sports fishery in off South Texas, say? They're, they're big issues that I don't know anyone have the, the data right now to resolve. Well, certainly not lay people or even politicians can answer without the help of scientists like yourself yeah. and uh, all the other scientists here at UL. Like